In September 1890, Wilfred Woodruff, president of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, met with his counselors with a vexing problem. How could they, as prophets and the first presidency of the church, prevent their religion from being squashed by the federal government over the practice of plural marriage? They ultimately decided that the Lord had confirmed to them that, quote, the time had come to meet the requirements of the country, to meet the demands that had been made upon us, and to save the people, unquote. When his counselors and apostles vowed to support him, Woodruff called for more than a thousand copies of his manifesto to be sent to the president, cabinet, senate, house of representatives, and other leading men in order to end the arrest of polygamists. The declaration was accepted and sustained by common consent at the next week's general conference of the church. Most Latter-day Saints seem to have approved of the decision. At least one Latter-day Saint, though, remained silent, his arm remaining at his side, like lead, he remembered, unable to approve the revelation. Another Mormon man wrote, Many of the saints seemed stunned and confused and hardly knew how to vote, feeling that if they endorsed it, they would be voting against one of the most sacred and important principles of their religion. And yet, as it had been promulgated by the prophet, seer, and revelator, and the earthly mouthpiece of the Almighty, they felt it must be proper for some reason or other. A great many of the sisters wept silently and seemed to feel worse than the brethren. In this episode of Abide, a Maxwell Institute podcast, we discuss the origins and implications of the Revelation Canonizes Official Declaration 1, also known popularly as the Woodruff Manifesto. My name is Joseph Stewart. I'm the Public Communications Specialist at the Neil A. Maxwell Institute for Religious Scholarship at Brigham Young University. Janice Johnson is a Willis Center Research Associate at the Institute, and we will be discussing each week's block of reading from the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints' Come Follow Me curriculum. We aren't here to present a lesson, but rather to hit on a few key themes from the scripture block that we believe will help fulfill the Maxwell Institute's mission to inspire and fortify Latter-day Saints in their testimonies of the restored gospel of Jesus Christ and engage the world of religious ideas. Hey, Janice, how are you? I am well. So how, how do we get to this place with Declaration Number 1? How do we get to this place in 1890? Well, it's a long story, and we're both historians, so we're going to start back where it began. Joseph Smith received revelation, inspiration, guidance on plural marriage as early as 1831, according to the Doctrine and Covenants. And as he practiced plural marriage and others in Nauvoo, especially in the early 1840s before Joseph Smith's murder in 1844, Joseph Smith practiced polygamy until his death in June 1844. And importantly, after Joseph Smith is assassinated, the way that plural marriage is practiced changes. While it had always been connected to the temple, very few people had received any of the ordinances associated with the Nauvoo Temple, including the endowment and sealing ceremonies. But after Joseph Smith's assassination, Brigham Young received inspiration that all worthy men and women should receive temple ordinances. And as that came to be, more people also entered into polygamous relationships. Now, this was something that was not very popular. It was something that caused a lot of tension within Latter-day Saint communities, including at winter quarters, where there were individuals fighting over who could be sealed to who and who would be in relationships with others. You can imagine on a grander scale, something like a singles ward, except that so many more people are looking to enter into relationships with eternal prospects. Now, The Latter-day Saints make their practice of plural marriage known publicly in 1852, when Orson Pratt uh, speaks at a general conference as directed by Brigham Young, and he gives the basis of two things for why the Latter-day Saints practice plural marriage. The first is because God directed it. This is something that cannot be overstated, that the Latter-day Saints practice plural marriage because God commanded them to. The second was looking to biblical justification, that patriarchs like Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob had practiced plural marriage, and it was something that was sound to Latter-day Saints. Now, in the Book of Mormon, in the Book of Jacob, it condemns polygamy, but there is a caveat that when the Lord commands it, it is appropriate for others to practice it. This becomes a hot-button issue throughout the 1850s in national politics, and by 1862, President Abraham Lincoln is signing the Moral Anti-Bigamy Act into existence. Now, this created land-grant universities, and it created opportunities for many people to receive land to farm on, but it was also one of its primary designs was to enact an anti-polygamy bill, because it was not actually illegal for someone to enter into a polygamous relationship at the federal level until 1862. 
However, so we've got this act in place outlawing bigamy. However, there aren't any federal funds allocated. There's no means whereby to enforce this law. So it begins to be a significant tension point between the Latter-day Saints and the federal government without really a way to to enforce. And we have to remember, too, that the majority of Latter-day Saints live far away from federal reaches of authority. So it wasn't just funds. It was manpower. It was the power of the state to reach out and to require Latter-day Saints to acquiesce to what the state had said. This changes in 1878. The church had floated a Supreme Court decision with George Reynolds testing the constitutionality of whether or not one could forbid the practice of plural marriage as a religious practice. They argued that under the Freedom of Religion Clause in the U.S. Constitution that they could practice plural marriage. This is something that would likely be supported today by the Supreme Court, but it was not at that time. And that's 1878. And at that time, Charles Devins, who's the U.S. Attorney General, argues that you can have freedom of thought, but when that action impinges upon the moral compass of the the country as a whole, then there is a problem. So the Latter-day Saints lost that, that test case, that Supreme Court test case with Reynolds. It's also important to remember that Utah, where the vast majority of Latter-day Saints live, is still a federal territory, which means that the federal government had ultimate policing control over Latter-day Saints living in those areas. And so federal legislation, which came in 1882, had a significant effect on the religious and daily lives of Latter-day Saints. And in 1882, we have the Edmonds Act, which declares polygamy a felony. It prohibits both bigamy and UC, which is unlawful cohabitation. So trying to cover whether you've got two wives or you've got lots of wives, but in unlawful cohabitation. So looking at the legal books, you see you see all over the place um, as their shorthand for these felony counts against people. And what else I think is funny is that Latter-day Saints are saying, well, all of you political leaders engage in extramarital relationships. We just marry the women that we're in relationships with, which wasn't the great defense that they probably thought that it was. But it's something to consider is that Latter-day Saints didn't just hang their heads down and give up. They continued to be committed to the principle because the president of the church continued to preach that it was necessary, that it was a commandment from God to do so. And for 50 years, this had become entrenched within the Latter-day Saints, that polygamy was not only a part, but it was essential for exaltation, for a celestial life. And when we get to 1889, we, with the Edmunds Tucker Act, the federal government claims the right to ch- to seize church properties in excess of fifty thousand dollars, financially disincorporating the church. And this is the point where something has to change. Right. I'll also take a quick moment to say that this is something in history written on the history of American religious freedom and on the history of the First Amendment that the Latter-day Saints are at the center of these two major stakes, first in 1878 with Reynolds v. United States, but also from 1887 through 1890 with the struggle to keep the church financially incorporated. Now, what does that mean? It essentially means, does it exist as a legal entity, as a legal church that can hold property, that has authority, that has rights and privileges and responsibilities as governed by the Constitution? This is something that will come later on, but it's important to remember that there's no way of defining what a religion is under the United States Constitution. Today, it's governed by whether or not the IRS means that it doesn't have to pay taxes on its income or on its donations. And so in 1890, that doesn't exist. And over time, the church and its lawyers continue to argue, no, this is a religious freedom case to which federal leaders will say, no, this is actually a morality sort of case. This is a, are you virtuous enough to be an American citizen sort of thing? They saw the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and its members practice of polygamy as an existential threat to the existence of the United States. And over time, the church eventually realizes that with the laws that are in place and with the interpretation of the Constitution at the time, they're not going to win a court case that declares the Edmunds Tucker Act with its stringent financial penalties to be unconstitutional. During this time, the church sacrificed much to uphold this belief. 
believing that this was or ordained of God. George Buchanan is at the center of the church's efforts to um, to live the law of plural marriage. Canon was a faithful member of the church. He served as a missionary in Hawaii in the 1850s. He and a native Hawaiian, jo- Jonathan Nampella, were central in translating the Book of Mormon into Hawaiian. By the time that we get to, to this period that we're talking about today, he is a member of the First Presidency. He has been jailed at the federal penitentiary at Sugar House for UC, unlawful cohabitation. We have those iconic pictures of, with George Q. Cannon in the middle of all of these Latter-day Saint men in stripes. And he has been on the run himself with other members of the First Presidency, and he is has also sacrificed much to, to uphold this. And he sees President Woodruff in the, the months and years that lead up to 1890. Um, he has heard him speak with other church leaders, asking about how they are supposed to uphold God's law and the, the land. These tensions pull to, to a breaking point. And in September 1890, President Wilford Woodruff is meeting with leaders in government and with banks and with lawyers, and he is just at a loss of what to do. And he records in his diary on September 24th, 1890, that the time had come to save the people. And this is something that I find particularly moving because it could not have been an easy decision to say that or even to consider it. In December 1889, President Woodruff and his counselors had sent out a circular letter, the same sort of letter that might be read over the pulpit at a Latter-day Saint congregation today, asking Latter-day Saints to fast and pray that they might be delivered from the federal pressure. And I can only imagine how difficult it must have been for President Woodruff to have recognized we fasted and prayed for an answer, and it's not the answer that we expected, or frankly, probably that they wanted. But nonetheless, knowing that it was a revelation that came from the Lord, this is something that comes through too when President Woodruff and his counselors, George Buchanan and Joseph F. Smith, remember the F, (laughs) meet with apostles and presidents of the 70. And those men there are in tears. And one says that I would have rather died rather than to change my position or the church's position on this, but I know that this came from the president of the church and it has been confirmed to me by the Holy Ghost that this is the course to take. And I think that many of us can look back on times in our lives when we've received revelation we haven't necessarily wanted to because it asked us to do something incredibly difficult, incredibly painful, or both. But this is what happens is that when the Lord gives direction, we need to follow it and trust him enough to do it. They were prepared to go to great measures, even greater measures than had already been taken. They were prepared to go to Canada or go to Mexico or do what was necessary if the Lord's word was that this needed to continue. But the Lord's word came differently, and that relief came differently. I think it's striking that in section 132, I think it's verse 52, but the Lord says it's actually 50, I make a way for your escape. And I think we see the fulfillment of that here. And I'm pretty sure it's not what they anticipate. In most instances, it's not. The The manifesto is announced publicly. It's published in the newspaper two weeks prior to conference. And then at conference, Wilford Woodruff asks his counselor, George Q. Cannon, to get up and to present it before the church. And this is a man who has sacrificed much to uphold plural marriage and this belief in plural marriage. And this is the day, so it's not completely unheard of that he would be asked on the spot to speak. This is the day of of church leaders getting up extemporaneously and speaking, not an assignment with months to, (laughs) to prepare and to plan. But Wilford Woodruff asks him to speak and he gets up and he is completely blank. His brain is blank. But He remembered back the conversation from the fall of 1889 when Wilford Woodruff met with the stake presidency, and he quoted section 105 to the stake president where the Lord said regarding the saints in Jackson County after the expulsion from Jackson County that the Lord had accepted their offering. And he he thought of that. And these words, oh, excuse me, it was 124 verse 49. So his blank mind is filled with this scripture. 
when I give in a commandment to any of the sons of men to do a work unto my name, and those sons of men go with all their might and do all that they have to perform that work, and their enemies come upon them and hinder them from performing that work, behold, it behooveth me to require that work no more at the hands of these sons of men, but to accept their offerings. George Q. Cannon says, I did get great freedom and spoke with ease, and all fear was taken away. And I think that's a really remarkable moment completing that that testimony for him but as he looks out there are people who are crying in the audience there are people who don't know what to do they've had a couple weeks but it still hasn't completely settled on them that they are taking such a significant change of direction yeah in 2012 there was a survey done that showed that latter-day saints of any mainstream religious group in the United States disapproved of polygamy or polygamous relationships more than any other. And I think about my great-great-grandfather who lived through the first manifesto, and he had two wives. And it's just remarkable to me to think about how much faith that it would have taken not only for President Cannon to say the words like into his mind, but also to think about those in the audience who weren't completely sure what it meant that they were being asked to no longer enter into polygamous relationships. Because in the statement, it reads like a legal statement, because frankly, it is a legal statement. That doesn't mean that it doesn't have religious value, but it does mean that it was presented as a way to get federal authority off um, as it came to change it in practice. But there is no firm direction given about what would happen to families who were affected by this. And I can only imagine taking that step into the unknown. One of my favorite folks in Latter-day Saint history, her name is Lorena Eugenia Washburn Larson. And she was on the run when the manifesto came out. They were camping out in Colorado, her and her husband. And her husband comes in to her tent and tells her the news of the manifesto. And she tells him to leave. And she sobs. And he asks, well, what's wrong? Which was probably the dumbest thing that he could have asked at the time. I think he should have known perfectly well what was wrong. She says, oh, this will be all fine for you. You will live with your first wife and I will have to go away like Hagar. And she talks about this darkness that overcame her. And eventually that night she receives a spiritual confirmation that the manifesto is the word of God. But we cannot underestimate the impact that revelation has on people, especially when they're not expecting it or it requires great sacrifice. I think that it's one thing for Latter-day Saints to make jokes about polygamy or to have to put up with jokes about how all Mormons are polygamous or things like that, but it's quite another to have to think about Lorena Larson and others who lived through the fallout of official declaration. And we get a variety of responses. Women always bore the weight of this. Zina D.H. Young, Bene. General Relief Society president uh, of two prophets wrote, Today the hearts of all were tried, but looked to God and submitted. And then some celebrated. Annie Clark Tanner said it was a great relief to be over. But I think that we can't forget about those who felt that dense darkness and worry about what this meant. One of my ancestors who died prior to the manifesto, I think would have felt similarly. She was the second wife who was stuck out in Tooele trying to scrape by and to have the prospect of no help from her husband would not be great. Yeah, we should also go on to say that President Woodruff eventually says very firmly, you are not to abandon your families, especially speaking to men. He says, I did not, could not, and would not promise that you, meaning men, would desert your wives and children. This you cannot do in honor. And I'm very grateful that he said that, but also wish that it could have been a part of the first manifesto so that there was clear direction from the beginning. I think that that could have saved a lot of heartbreak in the long run. Something else to think about, too, is that we started the podcast episode thinking about Joseph Smith's practice of polygamy in the 1840s, and then it ends in 1890. This is a very long process. We'll also say that this revelation, it so often comes as a process of many years. And thinking about Wilford Woodruff speaking not only to his counselors, but to wise people of many different backgrounds, people whose advice he sought and implemented because he trusted that the Lord would inspire him through those that he was speaking to. And I think it's crucial for us to remember 
that the revelation we receive often depends on the people we're talking to, not just the things we're reading, not just the temple sessions we're attending, but that God often answers our prayers through the thoughts and actions of other people. And this has been so deeply ingrained within the saints that it, they are not going to stop on it. They're not going to turn on a dime. It is going to take time. The end of the introduction, um, I would note that both the introduction to official declaration number one and number two are relatively new. They were both written for the 2013 edition of the scriptures. But the last line of the introduction of official declaration one reminds us this led to the end of the practice of plural marriage in the church. This was not the church stopping on a dime. This took years. Yeah. So this is something that I've discussed with other historian friends that it took about 15 years for plural marriage to become accepted widely in Latter-day Saint communities. It's not just accepted intellectually, but also practiced that way. It also took about 15 years for it to stop. So roughly 1840 to 1855 is about how long it took for it to become accepted in Latter-day Saint communities. And then 1890 to about 1905 is roughly how long it took for it to be an accepted practice within the church. And so this is also something that I would implore others to give grace to those who are learning new things, whether they're new investigators who are having a hard time thinking about coffee or attending two hours of church on Sunday, to yourself as an individual, that sometimes things take time, but that the Lord promises blessings when they're accomplished and help along the way until it is accomplished. The Lord's patience with us. And I think we also see this process um, along with the official declaration itself. We also have excerpts from speeches that Wilford Woodruff gave at the time. And I think those are useful for us to think about Wilford Woodruff's process and how he is going to lead such a significant change. For 50 years, they had understood this as essential to their salvation and exaltation. And that is going to be a, a a significant change. They're going to have to retool and rethink their whole concept of salvation. In those excerpts, we have from President Woodruff saying, I say to Israel, the Lord will never permit me nor any other man who stands as the president of this church to lead you astray. It is not in his program. Now, some use this to infer that prophets can't do wrong. <laughs> the prophets are infallible. But I think this context here is essential. He is saying, we've thought about the role of plural marriage in our salvation and exaltation one way for 50 years. And I am telling you, perhaps opening the way that maybe we misunderstood. Maybe this isn't essential. Maybe this thing of eternal marriage is the more important thing. And maintaining the temples and the places where we perform these ceilings is the more important thing. And I think that that context is, is essential to think about that quote. He is asking them to rethink and process their whole theological understanding of God and relationships. And that's, that's going to be hard. That is not going to, going to be easy, even for those I suspect for whom this was a great relief. I think that that's the perfect place to end our episode today. Hope you have a blessed week, y'all. Thanks. Thank you for listening to the Maxwell Institute podcast. Could you do us a favor and recommend this show to others? Review and rate the podcast in Apple Podcasts or other podcast providers or share the episode on social media. Thanks so much and have a blessed week, y'all.